Hare Krishna. So we continue our discussion on the demons in Krishna Leela. And today I'll focus on Trinavarta. So as Krishna grew up, he started becoming more active. Krishna is the Supreme Lord, but while he is a, in this world, he acts just the way that is required for the intensification of the reciprocation of love between him and his devotees. So, in the Anandandavan Champu, Kavi Karanapur describes that there are different forms of Krishna which are suited for different rasas. So he says the Bala Rupa is the Vatsalya Rasa Vigraha. That is the, in the child form, baby form, that is when the parental love is most intensely felt. Similarly, the <clears throat> when he becomes Kumar, the Kumar Rupa is suited for the Sakya Rasa, the Sakya Rasa Vigraha. So in this case, the demons when they come, we will see that the most intense trauma, anxiety, horror is experienced by Vishwadamai, especially. So in this case, Vishwadamai, she was just taking care of Krishna. Krishna was still a small baby. She, she picked him up on her lap. She fed him. And after he ate food with the mother's milk, he just went to sleep. And as he was sleeping, suddenly Mother Yashoda felt that he has become very heavy. So, what has happened? How did my child become so heavy? And she had a <clears throat> she had a, like a crutch for keeping Krishna, but she did not keep him there. Somehow at a subconscious level she thought that Krishna is so heavy that, that crutch will also not be able to hold him. So she put him on the ground. And actually, Krishna, he is Trikalagya. He knows past, present, and future. Vedaham samatitani vartamanani charjuna. Bhavishyani cha bhutani mamta vedana kashchana. Krishna says, I know past, present, and future, but me no one knows. So this means that Krishna knew the Trunavart is going to come. And Krishna wanted that this, even if this demon comes, the demon should cause the least damage. So he first of all made himself heavy by which Mother Yashoda would not be carrying him. Because when the demon comes, the demons are ruthless. They don't care for anything. Krishna will protect himself. But if the storm comes forcefully, the storm may knock down Yashoda also. The storm may hurt her also. If the demon is out there to attack, the demon will actually be ruthless. Sometimes when wars happen, <clears throat> the, the technical, the euphemistic term that they use is collateral damage. That means we wanted to kill this person, we want to destroy this, uh, this building, but the bomb went and fell on that building. So incidental damage, that's not what they wanted to destroy, but that's the word they use for that. So sometimes when brutal invaders come, they just don't care who all they are destroying. They just want to get to their target and anybody who comes in the way, they just indiscriminately attack and destroy them. So Krishna knew that Trunavarta was going to come for him. But Krishna did not want any collateral damage in Vrindavan. So he made himself so heavy that Mother Yashoda put him down. And again, Mother Yashoda put him on the ground. Actually, at that time, she had come to the courtyard because children, they are all day at home. Even if they are small babies, they like to come out. They like to see the sky, the birds. Even if they don't understand all these things, but they just like to be out in nature. So at that time, Krishna had come out to the courtyard. And in that courtyard, Rishita was had fed him and she was sitting. So she put him on the ground. And as she put him on the ground, she just looked around for a few moments to make sure that everything in the house was good. And at that moment, within a matter of few moments, suddenly a huge storm came there. Sometimes there are flash floods that come. 
at one moment the whole weather is normal the water, there's no water anywhere and another moment suddenly a flash flood comes and if people are caught in that they just get swept away so nowadays we have weather forecast and by that often calamities can be the calam the natural calamities may come but the calamities consequences of those calam calam calamities can be decreased if people are prepared and people retreat to safer zones so <clears throat> now in the we can use technology we can use meteorological science to try to make some forecast of how the weather is going to be but krishna he is the ultimate forecaster so they did not in vrindavan need any kind of forecast because krishna knew so krishna prepared krishna arranged that he was outside and then the trunavarth came it came like a huge storm it's like there are flash floods because there is a flash storm and zooming gust of wind just came knocking everything out of the way and everybody became blinded normally the atmosphere around us is we could say transparent right now in between us there is air there is there are so many gases and other substances but they are transparent you have there some dust particles they are so rarefied that they don't obstruct our vision but sometimes say fog or mist may come that may obstruct our vision but sometimes when a storm comes the sheer speed of the storm is so great that three many things happen one is that the that storm raises the dust from the ground and as the dust gets raised from the ground then it's like a wall of mist that is created around us a wall of mud that is created around us temporarily you just can't see anything another is that when this kind of storm comes it's so fierce that involuntarily also our eyes get closed we have various senses and <clears throat> some of the senses they are under our voluntary control some of them are not in our voluntary control so when somebody hits us near the eyes or just brings their fist near our eyes immediately our eyes get closed that is just a natural defense mechanism so when storms come at that time our eyes get involuntarily closed also and thirdly in this case uh, when trunavarth came he not only raised so much dust but he created scary noise when the wind comes because the wind is moving so fast and knocking everything along its way knocking down it just creates a thunderous sound so at one moment the weather seemed to be normal and at another moment you saw the storm coming straight from the sky just zoom through vrindavan now as it was just racing through vrindavan krishna by making himself accessible by keeping himself in the courtyard what happened krishna allowed trunavarth to do his work as quickly as possible if krishna had been inside the house trunavarth would have been in vrindavan and he would by the more he would have been in vrindavan the more damage he would have caused in vrindavan but in this case krishna just allowed him okay what do you want to do so you want to take me just take me so krishna even as a baby was thinking of protecting the prajivasis he was so concerned out of his love for them that these are my devotees and they should not be inconvenienced veer krishna is described as a supreme hero and braj janardhan whatever distress the prajivasis face he is always competent to protect them from all distresses so that child whom his parents were thinking that we need to protect them that child was thinking how can i protect them and so krishna was in a sense proactively planning as trunavart came krishna was readily accessible out in the courtyard with no other issues on near him on the ground and the storm just came picked him and went off and while the storm was there everybody was blinded mother ishoda was also blinded and he was what is this where is the storm come from certain areas in the world are known for storms say <clears throat> in america tornadoes hurricanes these kind of storms are common in india sometimes cyclones come on the 
eastern coast quite often but some parts of the country storms are not very common so hurricanes tornadoes cyclones they don't come so much in the central part of india so in vrindavan storms were not so common the rajasi they also heard of storms but storms are not so common and this kind of sudden brutal storm everybody in vrindavan was shocked and as a loving mother as soon as mother yashoda was blinded temporarily she looked at her, her vision recovered the storm departed so i look and she saw krishna is not there and she became frantic with fear running where did krishna go was there at one moment and next moment is disappeared the children are often very restless and you just keep them free for one moment and then they just run here run there and parents have to always be watchful where is the child gone so just as parents have to watch their child actually mother yashoda was watching the child but children even if they are restless they can run fast but they all have a finite speed with they can run so mother yashoda looked around where did krishna go she couldn't see him anywhere at all and then she has a storm had come and has krishna got swept away in the storm she was horrified at the very thought he was swept away where will he fall what will happen to him so look at him so panicking and as she was becoming overwhelmed suddenly the rajwasi they all gathered there but the rishuda just cried out in fear everybody became alarmed and they came when they came there they started looking around where is krishna where is krishna and suddenly one of the rajwasi is pointed krishna is there and they looked up and then they saw that this demon was there and if you see the picture of trunavar how it is the lower part of his body is like the winds of the storm the upper part of the body is the demon you can see the demon over there so the idea here is that there are subtle forces in nature and wizards most of the demons who came to attack krishna were wizards so these wizards can take up different forms so normally when we think of forms you may think okay somebody can become um, say somebody can take a animal's form like say marisha took the form of a deer or ravana took the form of a sadhu but the with mystical power now that sort of form is basically like a fancy dress competition isn't it we might ourselves we might be one person who might dress ourselves in another way now just dressing like someone is not what is being talked about when we talk about forms when marichi took the form of a deer he was not just like a human being dressed up as a deer he was actually taken the form of a deer so but there are further mystic powers by which one can take up forms not just of not just of other animals apart from humans but one can take up forms of mystic forces of, of of the forces of nature also so just like if we have we have ganga devi now what exactly do we mean by ganga devi there is the goddess ganga and the ganga also manifests as the water so when required she manifests as the person but even when she is not manifests as the person she is there as the water so um, this kind of taking of the form that the way the when we talk about a soul comes in a body there are different ways in which the soul can get connected with the body for us we are souls who come in a human body and then we stay in that body and then we depart from the body but in prabhu pad talk about tulsi devi prabhu pad said actually tulsi is one soul that every tulsi is actually a distinct tulsi but at the same time it is one tulsi devi who is manifesting through all tulsi so when <clears throat> so the embodiment of tulsi devi is different from the embodiment of all other plants she is one divine goddess who manifests in different forms so so, so for the for the rivers it is not that ganga is the body of the soul called ganga no the soul soul who is ganga devi she has a celestial feminine form but that form also manifests as the water body ganga so 
This kind of embodiment is different from say if we have Soma, who is the moon god. Now the moon is not the body of this god. He is the, the moon god is the presiding deity of the moon. So there are different ways in which the soul can connect with a material body or with a material phenomena. So by some mystic powers, Trunavart took the form of a storm. And when he took the form of the storm, he was by nature a demon. Normally when people assume any particular form, that they need some amount of mystical power to assume that form. And that mystical power requires some conscious intention. Okay, I want to acquire this form. And when that purpose is served, then they give up that form. And they return to their normal form. This can happen in multiple situations. One is, they wanted to do something, for that they acquired that form, they did the work in that form, and then they themselves voluntarily give up that form. The other is that if so this was the case of right now of Trunavart. He had temporarily taken up the form of a, of a storm and he had gone high up into the sky, from high up into the sky, from there he came rushing down, picked up Krishna and went high up again into the sky. And now that he had got Krishna, he had no reason to continue the form of a storm. So because his purpose was fulfilled, he gave up the form of a storm. But the other situation is, when a demon comes up in a particular form, like it happened in Putana's case, she came up in a very attractive feminine form. But when Krishna started sucking out her life air by uh, sucking on her breast, at that time suddenly her natural form appeared. This huge, hideous demoness. So what happened? In that case, for maintaining any form, a certain amount of mystic power is required. But when the life is threatened, the demon, in order to survive, tries to focus all the mystic, all the available power in just protecting oneself. And then whatever power they have exercised for manifesting that form, that power is no longer available. So, in that way, the they revert back to their normal form. So here, Trunavart for him his purpose was fulfilled and he went high up into the sky. Now his plan was, he was thinking this, Krishna is a dangerous character. He looks like a small child, but Krishna has killed Putana, Krishna has killed Shaktasur. I don't want to take any chances. He says, I'll go so high up in the sky, let's throw Krishna down from there. And throw the greater the height, you go up from there if you fall, the lesser is the chance of survival. So that was his plan. But we have our plans and Krishna has his plan. So Krishna went along with the plan of Trunavart. And Trunavart was thinking, yes, my plan is successful, I'm succeeding, I'm going high up, high up, high up. And as Krishna went up, Krishna was going up, so Trunavata was first holding Krishna by his shoulder. Like this, holding him. But as he went high up, Krishna just acted like a small child who's become fearful of the heights. Actually, Krishna on his side was simply enjoying a free ride. <laughs> high up in the sky, enjoying a happy ride through the sky. And high up. I he was going the wind, the sky, the clouds, it was so enjoyable, Krishna was enjoying. And Trunavat was going up and up and up. And then at the same time Krishna was aware that actually Mother Yashoda was becoming panicky. She actually swooned because of her panic. And Krishna said, now enough. And then as Trunavat was taking Krishna up, Krishna acted as if he was a fearful child. And when the children are fearful, you know what happens if, if the mother may be holding them and they may be just looking here and there, but if they become fearful, then they turn and hold their mother tightly. So like that, Krishna turned and held Trunavart with both his hands around his neck. And Trunavart thought, oh, this child has become scared now. So as Krishna held him up, what happened was, Trunavart decided, now I have gone enough height, I will throw him down. 
But Krishna had put his arms around his neck and he was going to throw it. And he was trying to push Krishna and at that time Krishna started pressing. Now Sanatana Goswami has written a commentary in the 10th canto called the Vaishnava portion. And there he describes that when Putana came and she tried to kill Krishna at that time, she screamed, screeched loudly. Mucha, mucha, let me go, let me go. She screeching and that screeching alarmed the Vrajavasis. So Krishna decided, I don't want the Vrajavasis to be alarmed. So what Krishna did was, he put his arms around the neck and held the neck so tightly that Trunavarth couldn't make any sound of that. He, he, he was completely choked. Now Krishna's hands are very small. But within those small hands, he has such power. So first Krishna used his power to choke Trunavarth. Trunavarth was trying to gargle, no sound was going to push Krishna away. And then, Krishna started increasing his weight. So Krishna has initially of the normal weight, from which he suddenly increased his weight, so that Madhuri Shula would put him down. And when Trunavarth came, again Krishna decreased his weight. But Trunavarth could easily take him. He thought he was an ordinary child. But now Krishna increased his weight so much, that Trunavarth felt himself being crashing. He said, wrestle it. He said, push the child away. But the child had held him so tightly, he just couldn't do anything. Just couldn't do anything at all. And he said, falling down, falling down, falling down. The same height to which he had gone up so that he would crash, throw Krishna down. Now that same height worked against him. Because if he had not gone so much high, he would not have fallen so bad. <laughs> but Krishna allowed him to go high up. And then Krishna used that same height to get him to crash down. And as he started crashing, he realized what is happening. He was alarmed. He, tried, he couldn't even speak. He was flailing his arms, trying to catch this child, push. Now, Krishna's body is so tender and his deep was ruthlessly trying to use his full force to try to rip Krishna away from his body. But he just couldn't do anything. And he just crashed on the ground. Bang! As he crashed on the ground, he just became dismembered and he fell dead. But Krishna fell on him and Krishna remained completely safe. And Mother Yashoda, when she had seen Krishna high up in the sky with this demon, she was so horrified. First, she thought, where has Krishna gone? The storm has taken him and she thought, well, Krishna has fallen. The storm has caused him to fall somewhere nearby. She saw he's high up. It was not just a storm, as a demon, the demon has taken Krishna. What is going to happen to my Krishna now? She swooned completely. The human body has a certain amount of capacity to experience emotions. If we get a heavy blow on the head, then what happens is, of course there can be brain damage, but even if there is no brain damage, if the capacity to experience pain of the body is exceeded, there is a natural defense mechanism, the body switches off. The body takes us to unconsciousness. So that we don't have to bear that much pain. Otherwise, that pain is not bearable. Just as there can be physical pain that is unbearable, similarly there can be emotional pain that is unbearable. Emotional pain that is unbearable means that sometimes some <coughs> sometimes people may hear some traumatic news. So they may hear that, oh, this person is Somebody hears that this person has died and some person might be carrying some, um, some woman might be carrying some plates to bring to her and she says, this person died, you just get shocked. The plates will fall off and she will fall down, unconscious. So there, the pain is so great that the body can't bear it. And one switches off at that time. So similarly from over here, Vishwana Mahesh just fell unconscious. And now the Vrajvasis were torn. On one side there is Krishna and on one side Vishuddhava is unconscious. So they are sprinkling water on her, trying to bring her to consciousness. And she was so she was so fearful that she just didn't come to consciousness. And then the Vrajvasis fired and told her, Vishuddha, Vishuddha, Krishna is back, Krishna is safe. And Krishna is safe. And I see how this she opened her eyes. Is really true. 
where is my Krishna? Where is my Krishna? She says, he was up in the sky. How is he safe? No, no, Krishna is safe. Narayan has protected him. Narayan has protected him. And then the, the Vrajvasis, the, the Yashoda got up, he says, the demon has fallen over here. They all ran over there. And some of the Vrajvasis have already gone there. They picked up Tunavat. They have picked up Krishna on the body of Tunavat. And they gave him to Yashoda. And when Yashoda got him, Again, Krishna had become so light, like a small baby. She took him and hugged him to her life. For her, hugged him to her boss medals. Her life had come back to her. So, Trunavart, he met his death with the very same means, the same height which he took Krishna, by which he was brought down and he was destroyed. So, Krishna Bhagavan ki. So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that Trunavart refers to useless argumentation. What he represents is the misuse of the intellectual faculty for arguing back and forth and on and on and on. <clears throat> Actually, in general, if we consider Vrindavan to be like our heart, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would say that more man Vrindavan, my heart is like Vrindavan. So the mind is usually equated with the heart because the mind is very emotional situated and the heart is also the seat of emotions. So, so now, if we consider Vrindavan to be like the heart, Krishna was present in Vrindavan. But Trunavarath came as a storm and took Krishna away. So similarly for us, arguments false or misleading or pointless arguments can come as a storm and they can sweep Krishna out of our heart. They can, they, just, they can create doubts, they can create confusion, they can create delusions and it's, we just lose Krishna. Tarko apratishtha shutayo vibhinna nasa vrushiryasya matam na vinnam So, uh, Tarko apratishtha. If one uses logic and argument, it is apratishtha. It ultimately has no foundation. Shutayo vimenna. That there are different books which say different things. And nasa vrusir yasse matam na bhinnam. Prabhupada translates this as that there are, all, there are different rushis who have different opinions. But the literal Sanskrit is even more interesting. What it says is na asa vrusir yasse matam na bhinnam. You are not, people do not. Somebody is not called a Rushi unless he has an opinion different from others. <laughs> Na asa Rushi. One is not a Rushi till one speculates and has his own opinion. So, people who are intellectual, often they have their own ideas. And with their own ideas, they can never come to any conclusion. And therefore, it is said, Mahajano Yenikata Sapantha. We have to follow Dharmasya Tattvam Nihitam guhayam. That the essence of dharma, the truth of dharma is hidden. Now, the literal translation guha would be a cave. So it is hidden in the cave. Now the cave here refers to the heart. Whose heart? It is the heart of the great souls. Mahajano yena gataha sapantha. That they are the great souls and you have to follow in their footsteps. So what does this pointless argumentation a mean in our lives. I'll talk about it at, this, at three different levels. First is in terms of our faith in Krishna Bhakti, in terms of the sec other people whom we are connecting with Krishna, their faith and how that can be distorted by arguments. And thirdly, I'll talk about how within the practice of Krishna Bhakti, there can be arguments. That this is the way to do things, this is the way to do things. And that way, there can be problems. Broadly speaking, there are two main distractions on the spiritual path. One is desire and the other is doubt. Krishna many times in the Bhagavad Gita tells us, Mai arpit mano buddhir, maam evaishyasya samshaya. Is offer your mind and intelligence to me and then you will come to me. So, from the mind, desire spring up. From the intelligence, doubt springs up. 
So in that way, the mind and the intelligence can both distract us from Krishna. It's like Krishna is saying, offer the mind and the intelligence both to me. Now there is a difference between desires and doubts in terms of the effect that they have on us. Generally, if some desires start dragging us here and there, they make us feel weak. They make us, they can, they desires, if they make us indulge in wrong things, they humiliate us. They, at least they humble us. And we, we, we actually feel the need for Krishna. I have to call out to Krishna. But when doubts come, actually doubts make us feel superior to others. If we are the associate of devotees and we start getting doubts, you know, and we may start thinking all these people, they are sentimental. They don't use their intelligence. This is, this is solid questions. They don't get these questions. What kind of brain do they have? So we start thinking that we are actually more intelligent than others when we have doubts. And thus, uh, doubts distract us, but doubt, because doubts can also create a sense of superiority within us, so the disturbance that they cause can be greater. It's uh, <clears throat> interesting that doubt on the spiritual path is considered to be a uh, spiritual weakness. It's a spiritual weakness. But among intellectuals, among scholars, doubt is considered to be an intellectual strength. They consider the capacity to doubt. We won't believe anything and everything. The capacity to doubt is our strength. We are, we are critical, we are skeptical, and we evaluate things thoroughly. Yes, we should evaluate things thoroughly. And at the same time, the Bhagavatam tells us that doubt is a function of the intelligence. viparyasa. <coughs> The Bhagavatam, Nishchaya Smriti Swapa Iti Buddhi Lakshana. It says that Samishaya is doubt, then Viparyas, apprehension, then recollection, then conclusion, and, and then sleep. So now what it means is that if we are living a materialistic life, and everybody tells us, oh, everybody, we are all going to be happy in life. Do this, do this, do this, we'll be happy. If we are to practice spiritual life, we have to have some doubts about the promises of materialistic culture. If we don't have doubts, we just keep believing. Let me do this, I'll become happy. Let me do this, I'll become happy. So, in that sense, doubt is a virtue. So many advertisements tell us, you buy this, you buy this, you buy this, and you'll be happy. It's amazing how people uh, believe advertisement sometimes you are utterly ridiculous. Uh, I saw an advertisement which showed uh, a car, a young young man was driving a car and uh, there was a young girl in the background looking admiringly at him, adoringly at him and there was another young man in the back glaring at him. And his ad said that buy this car and enjoy the envy in your neighbor's eyes. <laughs> now, enjoy the envy. Now, what a standard of enjoyment. Tomorrow they will get a better car and then they will say that I will enjoy the envy in your eyes. So, below that they said that the car says, you are your car. <laughs> you are your car. It is actually to identify with the body is bad enough. The body is a vehicle for the soul. The car is a vehicle for the body. <laughs> so, to identify with the vehicle for the vehicle, it is like you could say we have illusion and illusion squared. <laughs> so, illusion squared. And now, I was playing with words, so I said that is you are your car. So, you could translate it in Sanskrit as ahamkar. <laughs> And we have the Sanskrit word ahankar. <laughs> so ahankar is ahankar. So this is Vitya ahankar. <laughs> this is the false ego by which we identify with things. Now obviously you are not your car. Yes, you could say your car makes a statement about your financial your financial status or whatever. But but people just get so carried away by advertisements. 
So doubt in that sense is good. However, after we have some doubts, then this so doubt leads to apprehension. Maybe this maybe my current understanding is not right. So if I, we are living materialistically and we get doubts, how are all these things going to make me happy? We have some doubts about it. That doubt leads to apprehension. Apprehension means uh, we start evaluating, uh, hesitation and analysis. Maybe this is right, maybe this is not right. And then we come to a conclusion. Okay, this is not right. And then after that, whatever conclusion that gets reinforced within us as our recollection, as our memory. And the next time when we see it, you won't believe in it. You won't get caught by it. So doubt, the Bhagavatam says, is a function of the intelligence. However, doubt is not the only function of the intelligence. The nature of Tamaguna is that we take one thing and make it into everything. So, in 18.22 Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that Yattu Prutsnava Dekasmin Kari Satta Mahitukam Atatvartha Dalpam Chetattama Samudharitam One takes one thing, Prutsnava Dekasmin When we take one thing to be everything, then that's the problem. So yes, to doubt requires intelligence. But to keep doubting is not intelligent. See, if, I, if you are going to go to a doctor, at that time, a, a, we want to we want to evaluate. You know, is the doctor good? Is what the doctor saying makes sense? We needn't believe anything and everything the doctor does. If I if I got stomach upset and the doctor says I have to amputate your leg, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so it's good to have some doubts, but eventually we have to put faith. If we want to be treated, if we keep doubting every single doctor that we go to, then we will ourselves stay sick. So after some time, we have to take a take some faith, take a leap of faith, or you could say take a gulp of faith. You know, take a pill or take a tonic or take a medicine, whatever. So from doubt is required, but eventually we have to act. So, so the problem with false argument is that one just keeps doubting permanently. This is not right, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. So some people are skeptics. They just, they pride themselves, I am a skeptic. It's an international skeptics organization. And they feel very proud. We are skeptics. We don't believe anything easily. Yes, it is, it is good to have, as I said, some, some capacity of doubt. But the problem with, there's a problem with skepticism. That problem is that skeptics are skeptical about everything except skepticism. <laughs> they are not skeptical about skepticism. What do I mean skeptical about skepticism? See, skepticism can tell me, yeah, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in this. Skepticism can only tell us what is wrong. Skepticism will never tell us what is right. Is this clear? Okay, I can always be skeptical about anything. This, 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 this. If I keep being skeptical, the result would be that I will never arrive at any conclusion. So skepticism can never take us to the truth. It may take us away from falsehood. But skepticism alone will not take us to the truth. So skeptics may say, there is no absolute truth. Okay. Is this statement an absolute truth? <laughs> there is no absolute truth. But you are making an absolute statement, isn't it? So, is this statement an absolute truth? If they say yes, then that means there is an absolute truth. This one statement is an absolute truth. If you say no, uh, is there an absolute truth? No. Uh, so, there, there, there is, is this statement an absolute truth? No. Then what this means is, the statement that there is no absolute truth applies to this statement also. So, therefore, there is an absolute truth. The statement is true, it becomes false. If it becomes false, it becomes true. If you don't understand this, don't worry. <laughs> but the point is, there is no absolute truth is actually a self-contradictory statement. Because you are already making a statement. And that statement has to have truth value. It's like saying, somebody says, I don't know a single word of English. <laughs> 
<laughs> you already spoke in eight words. <laughs> so skepticism can skepticism can never take us to the truth. That's why we has to put faith at a particular point. Use our intelligence, we analyze, but then we have to put faith. And Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita that Sabdhavalabate Gyanam. He says it is by faith that knowledge comes. When we go to even science, study science, we put faith in the previous scientists. We may say, no, no, science keeps changing, science keeps developing. But yes, the development is based on studying what previous scientists have studied. We may revise something in what they have studied, but always we build on what previously have just been learned. So there is no way we can be completely skeptical. So if somebody is trying to practice bhakti, just keep doubting, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this. So Prabhupada was once in America, in New York, and he was giving a class, and one hippie, after his class said, Swami, your philosophy sounds like that of the Buddha. So Prabhupada said, do you follow Buddha? He said, no, no. <laughs> Prabhupada said, follow Buddha, follow Jesus, follow Krishna, follow someone. Don't just talk. Don't just talk. Why? I can argue this philosophy, this philosophy, this philosophy. We will just go on arguing endlessly. Ultimately, unless we practice something, we will not come to know whether it is right or it is wrong. At an intellectual level, it's like analyzing this medicine is good or this medicine is good. This medicine is good, this medicine is good. Ultimately, you have to take the medicine. Without that, how will we know? So there is, of course, the use of reason, but beyond that, there is the use of, uh, we have to put faith. So we all may have certain doubts. So uh, There are different questions. Sometimes some questions we may just not be able to get answers, we may not be able to be satisfied with the answers. So uh, in, uh, say, some devotees ask this question, uh, how did the jiva fall from the spiritual world? Did the jiva fall from the spiritual so there are, I say, this is a question. This is a question which is the favorite question of devotees for giving themselves an intellectual headache. <laughs> this, there are some questions which are like intellectual banana peels. <laughs> you know what is a banana peel? As soon as you step on it, you fall. <laughs> so like that, there's, there are some questions in the philosophy. So, Prabhupada made different statements at different times. Ultimately, he said that what happens outside the time domain is not really understandable. So, there is no need to put too much energy on this. Some devotees may have a particular understanding, other devotees may have different understanding. And whatever understanding seems reasonable to us, we accept it and move on. So, there are, when you practice bhakti, we all have to focus on what is central and, and put aside what is peripheral. One characteristic of intelligence is to differentiate between this. What is central and what is peripheral. So hold on to the central, let go of the peripheral. So in Bhakti, so Prabhupada was once asked by, a, by some disciples, he said that he was in Hawaii and the disciples asked him, Swami, Prabhupada, uh, when we talk with the scholars and we tell from the 10th canto that Oh, Putana was this big, or oh, there were so many thousands of thousands and thousands of bodyguards which uh, Trunava, which uh, Ugrasen had. So scholars started laughing. He says, How is this possible? Dwarka is such a small place. How could so many people live in Dwarka? And Prabhupada gave a very pragmatic reply. He said, Among the thousands of verses in the Bhagavatam, was that the only thing you found to speak with the scholars? There is a time when people can accept that God is, God has infinite potency and God can do extraordinary things. But if people don't have that, why go into that zone? So we talk about one offense in the Holy Spirit to instruct people, uh, to, inst <coughs> to instruct people in, faithless people in the glories of the Holy Name. Now what, where is the offense in that? Is it all, then all uh, outreach that we do, are we committing that offense? The offense is, that if we speak to people things that they cannot be expected to have faith in. So don't speak those things to them. 
as they go. It's like if we come to a temple, and sometimes when if we come, to, we want to climb up to go to the temple, say the stairs, but normal stairs are this much height. So if steps are this much height, you know, people people can't climb with their legs. They have to use their hands and climb up. Sometimes there are sometimes there are some temples on top of mountains, and people have to struggle to climb up. There's no clear path. So very few people are scaled like that. So to instruct a faithless person in the glories of the holy name means what? To show people a path which will require them to climb like that up to the to come to Krishna. No need to do that. We speak to things, speak those things to people which will help them to understand, which will make sense to them, and from there they take steps forward. It's not that we are denying things; it's just that we have to contextualize. So when so people have a lot of questions, and at that time we have to focus on that aspect of the of bhakti which connects with them. So with somebody we may have ninety nine percent disagreement. They may have ninety nine percent doubts, but find the one percent where they they have faith or at least they have openness, and focus on that. And from there, things will grow. If somebody is going to another organization, another following some other teacher, we start by saying, "Oh no, this te- this is this teacher is this teaching is wrong, or this is not right, is not right." They don't have the faith in us right now. Why? Why? Why, why can we expect them to have this? So begin with what is common. Among the thousands and millions of people who are living materialistically, that they are people who are actually interested in something spiritual. That is to be appreciated. Appreciate that, and then we have some common ground. So even if there's ninety nine percent disagreement, that person ninety nine percent doubts, find the one percent faith, one percent openness, and start from there. And when we do that, so if we go to the ninety nine percent differences, they get swept away. The storm will come, and they just go away from Krishna. If say for example, somebody asks. Krishna, so I say many people from India. Says, Krishna, I can accept as God, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how do you consider him to be God? And somebody say uh, replies, say in the Vayu Puran, hypothetically, in the Vayu Puran it is said that anybody who sees any difference between Krishna Chandra and Gaur Chandra will go to hell. <laughs> I think you answer like that. That person said you go to hell. <laughs> no, I don't care. Now the point here is that what is important? The important thing is that people's faith needs to grow. So if somebody has a question, we have to answer that question in a way that helps their faith to grow. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in in his book on life and teachings of Lord Chaitanya, he describes in the introduction very beautifully. He says that he describes a brief summary of Lord Chaitanya's life, along with some. Some of the extraordinary things like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made animals dance, some of the miracles that he performed, and then he concludes by saying that for the Bengali Vaishnavas, the the Bengali Vaishnavas have concluded that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is God, and for them these miracles they testify to his divinity. At the same time, Bhakti Nathakur is accommodating the pure paksha, the opposite is. Miracles are no conclusive proof of divinity. Even demons like Ravana perform miracles like changing their form. So the essential miracle of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is. I am paraphrasing here. The essential miracle is that if you follow the process of devotion he has given, you can experience the flood of love in the heart that has no parallel. That is extraordinary. So, irrespective of whether our esteemed readers accept his divinity or not, we do urge them to accept the process of devotion that is offered. So, if somebody starts practicing bhakti, the process of bhakti has the potency to give that faith. So, we can't demand faith right in the beginning. So, if we find that some people have a lot of questions, then okay, we can address their questions as much as possible, but don't get. Caught in questions, 
especially if questions are coming in a argumentative specu argumentative and combative mood then just be polite answer the questions as much as possible and if that it is going on and on then let them is give them some prasad give them something that will give them an appreciation of krishna bhakti and more. when the right time comes they will remember people may not remember what we spoke but people will remember how we made them feel a people will not remember exact argument that they had with us but if you are warm we are courteous if you are gentle they will remember that you had a big argument with this person but he remained calm he was nice to you and that will attract them this doesn't mean that we don't use logic certainly we use logic there is a time and place for it if the people people are approaching logically objectively then you give logical objective answer that helps but when the arguments are simply going to and fro at that time it's best to focus on the heart not in a sentimental sense but in the sense of creating a connection so arguments can just go on and on and on even in the indian tradition there is this there is the argument between the personalist and the impersonalist so the the vaishnava says the the impersonalist says so hum i am that absolute truth the vaishnava asks come and say no they had a the over there da so hum <laughs> hmm? i am not an absolute truth i am the servant of that absolute truth and the impersonalist come and say sada so hum i am always that absolute uh-huh. and the vaishnava asks come and da sa da so hum <laughs> <laughs> the impersonalist comments says sada sada soham <laughs> and the vaishya says da sada sada soham <laughs> so it just goes on <laughs> so the arguments can just go on forever we have to focus on practicing bhakti and encouraging others to practice bhakti and the last part i'll conclude is that while we are practicing bhakti ourselves sometimes arguments can be come up between devotees themselves this is the right way of doing things this is the right way of doing things and this can lead to so much conflicts one devotee had made a presentation and he showed me that you know there is this there is this picture of uh, some norman or greek warriors fighting with uh, with like a sharp weapon a sword in their hand and two swords are clashing with each other and on the both the swords are written prabhu pad said prabhu pad said <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes the god is may argue prabhu pad said this prabhu pad said that and based on that we may start arguing so we have to see that what was the purpose of prabhu pad the purpose of prabhu pad was to help people come closer to krishna and we can look at prabhu pad specific statements but the specific statements are not as important as his overall intent overall intent was to help people to become conscious of krishna and when the world changes the times change so we have to present krishna in different ways to different people so at that time some people said this is how prabhu pad did it okay yes this is how prabhu pad did it. but that's wonderful we respect it but if that if that way we are not able to connect with people then what do we do actually prabhupada did not do one thing if you look at prabhupada's preaching in america and prabhupada's preaching in india it's quite different in america it meant moving into the temples preaching meant and who became a devotee leave the world move into the temples but prabhupada in india not many people were ready to move into the temple hardly anyone practically speaking so then prabhupada's main preaching was make people life members engage them where they were and help them to grow that way so you could say that the the full time devotees in the temple were at this level and the life members were at a very loose level of commitment but prabhupada accepted them appreciated them encouraged them and most of the people who were life members they had their own religious teachers their own gurus their own paths and prabhupada did not always confront them sometimes if they were close and prabhupada they were asking prabhupada question they would, they would 
educate them. But Prabhupada will just encourage them to move onwards in their bhakti. Now if you see today, our movement is neither here nor here. Here is full-time devotees. Life members is, most devotees are congregation-based devotees. They are much more committed than life members, but not full-time devotees. So the whole ground reality is different. So when we say follow Prabhupada, Prabhupada gave philosophical principles and Prabhupada gave practical guidelines. So in spiritual life, there are principles and there are preferences. Principles means they remember Krishna. That is the principle. The preferences, okay, okay. We, how do I remember Krishna? So somebody may remember Krishna by by singing kirtan. Somebody may remember Krishna by hearing the Bhagavatam. Somebody may remember Krishna by memorizing verses. Somebody may remember Krishna by worshiping the deities. That is that flexibility is there. Prabhupada himself. Now Prabhupada at one level he said that. I haven't changed anything. I'm like a postman. I have given the Krishna, I have given what my spiritual master has given. But in another lecture, Prabhupada says, I have practically invented the Krishna consciousness movement. Now, what did Prabhupada mean? Prabhupada says this in the context of the Bhakti Rasamrath Sindhu statement that Yena Kena Prakarina Mana Krishna Niveshit. Somehow or other fix the mind of Krishna. So Prabhupada said that when he says, I have invented the Krishna consciousness movement, what he meant by that is, I have created ways for people to remember Krishna. And Prabhupada says it is the responsibility of the spiritual master to create ways by which the disciples can remember Krishna. So, like that, in today's world, different devotees may do different things. And some devotees say, this is right, this is right, this is right. Actually, if such kind of, such kind of arguments start happening, it's best to keep a distance and keep practicing Bhakti. Otherwise, arguments can just go on and on. And especially, arguments inside the community, inside the movement, they can be very demoralizing. We are trying to reach out to the world and get people to Krishna. As long as the principle of getting people to Krishna is maintained, the preference of how that is to be done, that will vary. Otherwise, the arguments just go on and on and on and on. And so much energy gets sucked. But instead of letting all that energy get sucked, just focus on practicing Krishna Bhakti, focus on sharing Krishna Bhakti. And we'll, we will ourselves relish it and others will relish it. And in that way, we can move on towards Krishna. I'll conclude with one past time, Shri Prabhupada. Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and the devotees had a debate over there, conflict. So, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and other devotees were there. Tamal Krishna Maharaj was servant of Prabhupada. And some, one group of devotees said that actually the only difference. The only difference between Krishna and Balaram is in complexion. So, but another devotee said, no. Actually, only Krishna is the Lord of Radharani. But Balaram is not. Says, no, the only difference between them is this. So this argument went on, the other points also, but it became heated. And they went to Prabhupada. And one party said, Prabhupada, the only difference between Krishna and Balaram is in complexion. Prabhupada said, yes, that's right. Uh, Prabhupada, and the other one says, the only difference between Krishna, but, but only Krishna is the Lord of Radha. Yes, that's right. But Prabhupada, both of them can't be right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But then Prabhupada, what is the right? That you decide. <laughs> <laughs> so Prabhupada just let it go over there. <laughs> so there are, it's not that in the process of bhakti, we have to make Krishna the hostage of our intelligence and get extract answer for every question. We just keep practicing bhakti and answers will be revealed in your course. And this Dronavart, he swept Krishna. If we just get too much into intellectual analysis, this, 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 this. It's like, we may think I am being such an intellectual. I can quote this verse, I can quote from this, this point, I can quote this, I can quote this. And all that we are doing is, we are simply increasing the height from which we will fall. <laughs> <laughs> we quote all the Shastra and we become very proud and very argumentative. And all that is happening by that is, where is our heart is getting dry. See, arguments sap the rasa from the heart. So it's best, you know, the world is a big place. 
and if we feel that something is not right then we can start something and we can ourselves set a set an example of how to do it right why criticize someone else there are so many people in the world who don't have krishna bhakti if somebody is trying to give krishna to others if we feel oh, this is not the way to do things then nobody is stopping us from doing something ourselves so if we can avoid this pitfall of argumentation we we'll have so much energy available for reaching out to others and reaching out to krishna in our own hearts and we will enrich our heart with devotion and enrich the hearts of many many others so I'll summarize i spoke about the theme of trnavarta and how endless argumentations are formed so in that i spoke about i started with the passing of trnavarta how krishna all the small baby who who needed protection but krishna was arranging for the protection of the rajavasis he first increases weight mother yashoda put him on the ground in the courtyard so that when trnavarta came minimum damage and then krishna allowed trnavarta to take him high so that he could have a free ride and then he choked him so that he couldn't even scream so that he wouldn't alarm the rajavasis and the same height which he was planning to use to get krishna to Uh, fall and took to throw down Krishna. That same height Krishna used to end Trunavat. So, but the, the whole uh, Balila pastimes they also demonstrate the Vatsalya rasa of Ishuna Mai. She was intensely in anxiety. And practically, her life went away when Krishna went away. When Krishna came back, her life came back. Well, Trunavat represents pointless argumentation. Talked about how doubt is a doubt is a intellectual virtue or intellectual strength up to a particular point it can, it becomes a spiritual weakness if that doubt prevents us from committing to anything so skepticism is is good we need to doubt the promises of materialistic culture for providing providing us pleasure but if we have to be skeptical about skepticism also that means skepticism can only tell us what is wrong never what is right and other skepticism ends up with self contra- contradictory statements and to deal with doubt uh, to avoid endless argumentation i talked about three things first is for our self application if we have some doubts if the overall philosophy of krishna consciousness makes sense if the central points make sense then put the peripheral points aside like say the fall of the jiva or the huge num- dimensions in certain aspects of the bhagavatam they are not the central thing central thing is connecting with krishna and experiencing krishna bhakti if somebody can't accept chaitanya mahaprabhu's divinity we just practice bhakti right now don't not argue about that if somebody is uh, then we talked about the outreach that if somebody is arguing too much then that will simply lead to alienation so people may people will forget what we spoke but they will remember how we made them feel So even if there's ninety nine percent doubt and disagreement, focus on the one percent commonality, and begin with that. And if we can't make any further headway, end with that. End with cordiality. End with nice. End with being nice to people. And eventually in their life, that memory will inspire them to explore further in the direction of Krishna. And within devotees, when there are conflicts about how Krishna bhakti is to be practiced, we have to see that actually. we say we say prabhupad said this but more than prabhupad's specific statements is prabhupad's more important than prabhupad's specific statements is his overall intent which was to help people remember krishna and prabhupad was resourceful and multifaceted in say how he introduced krishna bhakti in america and how he introduced it in india and it was all right there but through his con how he introduced it so our movement is neither filled with full time devotees now nor Main life members. It is a bit with congregation members. So the situation is different, and Prabhupada was just as first. Prabhupada was resourceful in providing people ways to remember Krishna. Similarly, uh, we also and our leaders will also do that. And if we find that something doesn't, uh, we can't appreciate something, then rather than criticizing something, just keep a distance and do something constructive. The world is a big place, and instead of fighting, um, arguing, and fighting among each other. we can actually expand the reach of krishna in whatever way we feel inspired to do and as if we avoid the storm of our needless argumentation then krishna will enrich the vrindavan of our hearts 
and Krishna will enrich the hearts of many others also. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, Krishna. Thank you, Raj, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, you've made a parallel between Tinavarta and Angela's uh, arguments. What other parallels um, with other demons uh, Krishna defeated in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam? Like, for example, Putana or Kamsa. If there is any kind of example. Yeah, Bhaktivinoda Thakur used this. He talks about Putana representing a false guru, a misleading guru. I spoke on that in uh, two classes earlier. Then there's Shaktasur, he represents lethargy. So Bhakti Nathagwa is talking about this in Chaitanya Shikshamra and Krishna Samhita both. He gives several demons and he says what they represent. So the sons of uh, <coughs> Devaki who were killed earlier, uh, before Krishna was born, they represent the six Anarthas. Balram represents the Guru and when the six Anarthas are removed and then the Guru comes and cleanses our heart, then Krishna manifests over there. Okay. You said your second question? Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering, you also said the commentaries to Srimad Bhagavatam were made by uh, Sanatana Goswami and Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Are they available in English? Uh, yeah, Bhanu Maharaj has translated them. Bhanu oh, Swami has translated them. Oh, Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you for the wonderful class. So in the class you mentioned about Yashoda Mai uh, not being able to tolerate the pain of Krishna being away and also the human body can faint when it cannot. So the question is, uh, Krishna, even in the 5000 years back, was in his spiritual body. Hmm. So now one level next, his immediate relatives and gopis and gopas and cows we are told all of them had come from Vrindavan to participate in his Leela. Mm. So, how to understand whether they were in uh, their original spiritual bodies or they were in yeah. souls which were in the material bodies? How to understand that? Your Krishna's sons uh, are referred in Krishna book, right? Yes, yes. So, at what point in time the sons of Krishna and their sons, at what point in time it became material? Okay. Sorry, today is a question of doubts. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, he said Krishna came in a spiritual body. But what about Krishna's associates? If they also came in a spiritual body, then there are so many generations who came after Krishna. So, at what generation the body changed from spiritual to material? Yeah. I would say that even if the body is spiritual, for, for practical purposes, their body functions uh, within the Leela in a way that is whatever is required for the Leela. So, okay, Yashadamai's body is spiritual, but then from our breast she produces milk. So now, is that milk also spiritual? Okay, if the milk is spiritual, then the food that she ate, is it also spiritual? Okay, the food that she ate is spiritual, and the grains from which the food was made, are the grains also spiritual? Then, the grains were produced from the earth, the soil is also spiritual. But where do you stop it over there, if you go like that? So, actually, Ramanucharya elaborately analyzes this, that <clears throat> what exactly is spiritual and what exactly is material, when the Lord says. So this, first, the first principle is it's, it's extremely difficult to understand. But the essential point is that whatever is required for the purpose of the Leela, that is done. And even Krishna's body can manifest blood. When Bhishma shoots arrows, Krishna's body seems to manifest blood. But is it material? No, oh, it is. No, it's not. For the purpose of Leela, that is what is required, that will be manifested. And the, there are some aspects where there is a differentiation. Say for example, some gopis, when they come to Krishna, uh, when Krishna plays the flute and calls the gopis, so some are unable to come. And then the Bhagavatam says that in their intense longing for Krishna, they give up their bodies. 
and they were separated they were separated from krishna because they were restricted but by giving up their bodies they left and they were united with krishna in a spiritual thing so that the acharya described that these were uh, these were gopis who were sadhana siddha who were not yet completely pure and so the other gopis who were nitya siddha they were able to unite with krishna some were not able to unite with krishna but then they became completely cleansed and then they were able to unite with krishna so there is certainly <clears throat> there are certainly some associates who are eternal but we can't really say that everyone over there was eternal mother ishwara's body fainting well the point over there is that anand navan chapu talks about this not with to mother ishwara with respect to radharani that when krishna leaves radharani in the forest and rasleela and goes away radharani fades and he says over there that he talks about the murcha devi murcha devi is con- is unconscious he says that the pain of separation from krishna was so great for radharani that she couldn't have survived so in order to save her murcha devi came and she made her unconscious so it's told in a more poetic way this principle what i spoke so the same principle will apply to ishwara mai also uh so now there are certain associates who are definitely as eternal associates but many in krishna lila may not be is it that when krishna goes from dwarka to vrinda dwarka to hastinapur are all dwarka vasis are all hastinapur vasis are all the people in between eternal associates not necessary they certainly special and fortunate to be there because chaitanya mahaprabhu is patit pavani se now if everybody around chaitanya mahaprabhu was is his associate is his eternal associate then they are already pavan then how is he being patit pavan is it it everybody is pure then his mission itself will be defeated if we say that oh jaitanya mahaprabhu went to south india all the people saw they were already the associates and then he didn't purify them anyway what is his potency so i would say that there are some people who are eternal associates but not everyone and even his eternal associates they don't necessarily even their bodies don't necessarily act as if they are spiritual bodies that means the body acts in a way that is that is required for the reciprocation of the lila so whatever it is so mother ishwara body can produce milk krishna when he commits mischief sometimes he passes urine so that 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 is that a material body no krishna is doing that for the purpose of lila so basically <clears throat> the spiritual body is rather than going into the technicality i'll conclude the answer the purpose what do we mean by spiritual what do we mean by material that which is used for serving krishna is spiritual that which is used for personal enjoyment that is material so if for serving krishna Uh, the body is physical mechanism plays a role so krishna gets a headache then the gopis give their dust now how can krishna get a headache krishna the spiritual world is free from old age disease and death krishna is the one who frees us from that how will krishna get a headache that's a leela so if some mati- if some physical mechanism of the material body is required for enhancing krishna's pastimes that will be manifest according to the arrangement of yoga maya so to be differentiated in the spiritual material at a functional level there's a philosophical differentiation that matter is achit uh, matter is unconscious it is temporary all that the uh, spirit is sachidananda that is fine philosophically we have to have that differentiation no doubt this is the body this is the soul but functionally we have to focus on the purpose if we start getting too much into the analysis suppose there's a joke in the class and before laughing am i laughing for krishna's pleasure or am i laughing for my pleasure <laughs> <laughs> if we start doing like that <laughs> you know okay it's it's related to krishna's philosophy just laugh <laughs> don't worry so much so if we go to into this i one point about argumentation endless argumentation they say this and anal- paralysis by analysis paralysis by analysis they give the example there was a graceful uh centipede a uh, thousand leg uh insect or whatever creature dance very gracefully 
And then there was a bird who couldn't dance at all. And the bird was very envious of the centipede. So he says to the centipede, oh, you dance so nicely. No, I want to understand how you dance. So he says, after you put your 66th foot down, when do you put a 67th foot or do you put a 68th foot? Oh, really? I put my 66th, 67th? And he kept asking questions like this and the centipede, hey, should I put this foot down? Should I put this foot down? Should I put this? He just caught so caught in thought, he couldn't dance anymore after that. <laughs> so like that, in bhakti, if we just philosophically we analyze the difference between the, between the body and the soul, to understand the spiritual material, but functionally, if you get too much in the analysis, is this material, is this spiritual, we will get in trouble. We just focus on, is this serving Krishna? No, that whatever the Vrajivasis are doing, they are completely devoted to serving Krishna. So, even in our day to day life, if we are taking care of family, our family responsibility, we are doing our job, at a functional level, if we think, oh, this is material, then we feel half hearted about doing it. This is spiritual, let me do it all and all and No. If you are doing it in the mood of service, it's spiritual. Functionally, we don't have to differentiate too much. We try to cultivate the intention of serving Krishna for his pleasure and just do what is to be done. Thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada ki, Gaura Bhaktavanda ki, Gaura Prema Arande. Is Gaya Shetanajaran Gaura ki.